Good morning. Welcome to Morgan Valley Christian Church on this January 23rd of 2022. We welcome you wherever you are in the world today. Uh, we pray that uh, you are safe and healthy and staying warm or comfortable wherever you are. We thank you for joining us today at our online worship service. Uh, we are still continuing to worship online only, and we thank you for joining us. Uh, we pray that this pandemic is brought under control. We pray for our numbers here in Utah to recede so we can resume worshiping in person. I uh, received reports of more and more churches going to online only uh, because of the rising COVID numbers and we hold all of our healthcare professionals in our prayers and close to our hearts as they are beseeched by yet another wave of coronavirus and we just ask you all to be in prayer for them and the rest of our frontline workers who are also being exposed to COVID, all those essential workers who are also being inundated with COVID and our teachers. We just ask you to be in prayer that this pandemic is brought under control in 2022. I'd like to invite you to join us in our call to worship. Loud talkers and silent worriers, glad handers and lonely wallflowers. God gathers us together to be the body of wonder and joy, of hope and healing. Bystanders with hands shoved into our pockets, frady cats whose feet are frozen in place. Jesus calls us to carry grace to outsiders to walk with all those left behind. Kids who never offer answers in class. Bashful folks whose tongues tie in knots. The Spirit anoints us to speak up for the voiceless, to partner with the poor, to discover their gifts. And here is our empty sanctuary. We pray for that we will be able to return soon to uh, in-person services and to see each other again. Let us be in prayer for our numbers to recede. And now we come to that time when we join in prayer together and we will conclude with our uh, Lord's Prayer. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for this day, this Sunday, this message that you have thoughtfully provided to us. We pray that we will have the ears to hear, the eyes to see, the hearts to feel the message you have today. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit within each and every one of us. And we pray that the Spirit will guide us to take what we need of this message and to go make the world a better place as you have guided us to do and designed us to do. We pray for everyone who is dealing with this pandemic. We give thanks for science and the, and the vaccines and the treatments and protective masks, everything that has been brought to bear to help us weather this pandemic. We pray against misinformation that has convinced so many people to avoid the vaccines, to not wear masks, to um, endanger themselves and others. We pray against the politicization of this pandemic. We pray for compassion for all. We pray for those who are most vulnerable, who are marginalized, who do not have the resources, who are forced to go to work and be exposed to COVID. We pray for all those who are hospitalized and with this latest variant, the increasing numbers of small children 
who are being impacted and being put on ventilators and whose families are praying for their survival. We pray for this pandemic to be brought under control. We trust in your plan. In some ways, we give thanks for the Omicron variant whose quick spread and rapid declination may help us to get back to normal. But we pray for all those who have chosen not to get vaccinated who are being impacted the worst. We pray for all our families. We pray for all those empty places at tables today. We ask you to be with all of us, to give us strength today for where we need strength, to give us hope where we need hope, to show us love where we need love, and for us to experience joy at the awe of your work on this earth, in our neighborhoods, and within ourselves and our families. We give thanks for all you have given us this week and have planned to give us in the future. And we humbly join together in praying together as your son taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now we come to that time when we share in the reading of our lessons. Our first lesson today comes from Nehemiah 8 verses 1 through 3, 5 through 6, and 8 through 10. All the people of Israel gathered into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the, Lord, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Our second reading today comes from 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 31. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, 
Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we were all made to drink from one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. Our Gospel reading comes from Luke 4, verses 14 through 21. Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, with a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. May God add his blessings to these words. Henry Nouwen wrote about spiritual reading. He said, Spiritual reading is not only reading about spiritual people or spiritual things. It is also reading spiritually, that is, in a spiritual way. Reading in a spiritual way is reading with a desire to let God come closer to us. The purpose of spiritual reading is not to master knowledge or information, but to let God's Spirit master us, strange as it may sound. Spiritual reading means to let ourselves be read by God. Spiritual reading is reading, 
with an inner attentiveness to the movement of God's Spirit in our outer and inner lives. With that attentiveness, we will allow God to read us and to explain to us that we are what we are truly about. So what we see here in the first scene is from the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. And it describes a beautiful and hard-won moment in Israel's history. Nehemiah was a uh, minor figure in the court of our taxeries, our taxerses, I should say, the king of Persia. When Nehemiah hears that Jerusalem is a broken, fire-raised wreck, he begs the king to let him return to his homeland and rebuild the city of his ancestors. The obstacles to the rebuilding are fierce and numerous, but Nehemiah persists and finally succeeds in restoring Jerusalem's wall and gates. He then invites his people back from exile and asks them to gather in the square before the water gate for an assembly. And so our scripture today picks up there at the moment when the prophet Ezra opens the book in the sight of all the people and he reads from the law of Moses from early morning until midday. He reads until the assembly of men and women gathered in the square open their ears, understand, stand up, raise their hands, worship with their faces to the ground, say Amen, Amen, weep as they hear the words God has for them, and then return to their homes to eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared, because the joy of the Lord is their strength. It's an astonishing image of a communal Bible reading experience that takes a diverse group of people on a journey from attentiveness to comprehension to affirmation, to wonder, to grief, to worship in joy, to celebration. We can read it over and over again and get that aching sense of need, desire, and envy. When was the last time you read the Bible with such sustained attentiveness and expectation? When was the last time you savored the sweetness and the sorrow it contains? When was the last time you trusted God's word to tell you your story, to hold, recognize, and contain you, to name the contours of your past, present, and future in ways that brought you to your knees in grief and gratitude? When was the last time you allowed the good book to draw you so deeply into community that you couldn't help but celebrate and share the goodness of God with other people afterwards? Something powerful and transformative happens when Ezra opens the book. What happens is not magic, neither is, is it manipulation. What happens is that the people consent to listen to God's word with their whole hearts, to receive what's read in a spirit of openness and vulnerability, and to express their comprehension in acts of celebration and sharing. What would it be like to open the book and find such authentic joy. The next scene takes place centuries later in the backwater town of Nazareth. It's a Sabbath day, soon after Jesus' baptism and sub subsequent temptation in the wilderness. Filled with the power of the Spirit, Jesus returns to his hometown, enters a synagogue he has likely attended since boyhood, and stands up, as is the custom, to read from the prophets. He asks for the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, unrolls it, finds the passage he wants, and reads aloud. By the time he's finished reading, every eye in the synagogue is fixed upon him. Luke offers us this reading scene as the inaugural act of Jesus' ministry. 
an act in which he proclaims his identity, his purpose, his vocation. What I love about the scene is that Jesus chooses to reveal the meaning of his life and work through the beloved and well-worn words of Scripture, words his audience has heard a thousand times, words no doubt rich with communal memory and meaning, but also words in danger of losing their power through over-familiarity. It's not as if the Son of God is incapable of penning a new and shiny mission statement. He is the incarnate Word himself. But he doesn't improvise. He opens the book and makes the old words out of the tradition his own. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, as if to say the word lives here and now. It is organic. It breathes. It moves in fresh and revolutionary ways. The word of God is neither dull or dead. It is alive. But as we'll see in the coming verses over the coming weeks, that opening the book doesn't always go smoothly for those bold enough to attempt it. Unlike the assembly that joyfully receives Ezra's reading, Jesus' audience recoils in shock and outrage when he makes the words of Scripture his own. And yet, just for a moment, when Jesus stands before them, unrolls the scroll, and reads, they find themselves riveted. As I contemplate this scene, I wonder if the Bible is fresh or dull, organic or stagnant, alive or dead in my spiritual perception. Is the Bible a go-to book I open when I'm searching for meaning and purpose? Do I allow it to shape my core longings? Would I ever search its pages as Jesus did in order to find my name, my vocation? For me, the danger is over-familiarity. A cynical refusal to be surprised surprised by a book I've known since I was a little kid in Sunday school. For others, the dangers might be unfamiliarity or apathy or fear. And yet for all of us, the challenge remains to unroll a scroll, to read and receive, to find the joy of the Lord in a collection of ancient pages brimming with the life and testimony of the Holy Spirit. If we can do these things, then we will be released to share God's abundance with others, and our worship will become a feast. This is the beautiful and unending invitation. What happens when you open the book? May you open the book this week. May you find new and meaningful words to you. May you be able to hear and comprehend and find joy in those words, just as we heard in the reading by Ezra, in the witness of Nehemiah and those gathered around. May you not be fearful of what those words might bring you. May those words be fresh and new and not dull or stagnant. May those words be alive and not dead. In this time of pandemic, of waves, of variants, and taking precautions, and politicization, of weariness, of having to be on guard and to wear masks and to distance ourselves for our own protection and protection of others. May we find solace, may we find joy, may we find hope in the words to which you turn today when you open the book. May the Holy Spirit lead you to those words today as you open the book. May you feel led to the words that bring you comfort and renewal today. The word of God is neither dull nor dead. 
It is alive. Amen. And now we come to that time when we uh, would share in our gathering and benediction together, where we join together and sing, Walk with me, I will walk with you, and build a land that God has planned where love shines through. Oh, first, let me go to uh, our, our sending here before we do that. Now, we are scattered by our God to carry grace into a broken world. Now, Jesus scatters us to bring justice to the outsiders, to visit all who are alone and lonely. Now, filled with the Spirit, we are scattered to gather up the dispirited, to take hold of the lost and embrace them as family. And we hope to see you again at Morgan Valley Christian Church, and we look forward to warmer days for sure. And now, once again, we come to that time where we join in our gathering and benediction together. Will you sing with me? Walk with me, I will walk with you, and build the land that God has planned where love shines through. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. May the blessing of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. I forgot that part of our service. So we have a tradition where we share the peace with one another. So may the peace of Christ be with you this day and in the coming days this week. And we look forward to seeing you again next Sunday at Morgan Valley Christian Church. God bless you. God keep you safe and healthy and also your family. Amen.